Medical Medicine, Vice Dean and Section Chief of Renal for Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College. As Executive Medical Director for Westchester Medical Center, she oversees quality, safety, and regulatory initiatives and has extensive experience with quality initiatives as they relate to patients with kidney disease. Dr. Garrick serves on the New York State Committee for the Safety Evaluation of Office-Based Surgery, is a past member of the RPA Board of Directors, and is the current chair of RPA's Quality, Safety, and Accountability Committee. Dr. Garrick, I hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Dale. Um, just as an update, thank you everyone for joining us. This is the third in our series of webinars focusing on patient safety initiatives in dialysis. And it's just for those of you who are just joining us, this is a broad-based stakeholder group that's looking at ways to leverage all that everyone has been doing across the dialysis continuum of care to improve the safety for our dialysis patients within our dialysis units and as they transition their care. Today we're going to focus on infection control, and our next webinar will focus on the summation of transition of care, and then the stakeholder group will pause and evaluate what we might be able to do as next, next best steps to leverage all of our activity and think about ways we can improve care. So we're very fortunate today that we've had a broad-based faculty that's helped us put this initiative together for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Paul Miller, who's in private practice in Louisiana, and Dr. Paul Polevsky, who's a professor of medicine um, in the Renal and Electrolyte Division at the University of Pittsburgh, both contributed to today's work. And we're fortunate enough to be able to have on the call with us uh, Dr. Tamara Kerr, who um, I think some of you have met in our previous webinars. She, along with the, uh, Beth Ulrich from Anna, led the uh, initial culture of safety survey that was done in dialysis units, and of course David Van Wyck, who is a VP of clinical services from DeVita Healthcare Partners, and they're going to lead us in today's discussion. So let me tell you a bit about uh, David. He comes to us from the DeVita. He's the Vice President of Clinical Care Services at DeVita Healthcare Partners, and is an emeritus professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson. And he focuses his work on quality and safety in dialysis facilities, physician leadership, chronic kidney failure, and end-stage renal disease. And he does research to advance the knowledge of the care of patients with kidney disease. So David, if you'd like to lead us in the first part of the discussion on infection control initiatives within our dialysis facilities. Well, thank you, Renee, and thank you so much, uh, uh, everybody on the call, for being here. It's a privilege to be part of this conversation. Uh, this is an important conversation, as you know, and that's what got you here. We will um, begin by uh, taking a few uh, audience polls just to find out where you are on these, on um, some of the key issues, and then we'll move to the review of the survey of the uh, patient safety uh, culture survey. Uh, by Dr. Kerr, and <clears throat> then we will end up with a uh, an abundant time for discussing what one step can we do next. Um, this is a patient safety meeting. This is a meeting in which all voices are important. Your voice is important. We don't just hope that you will participate. We expect and need you to participate uh, because our patients are not safe. If we are not speaking to the uh, issues that concern us and the issues that uh, offer us opportunities for improvement. Uh, let us begin with the audience poll. The question, do you include patients in your infection control training and education program? Simple yes, no. Seventy-seven percent answer yes. Twenty-three percent answer no. Uh, watch, watch these uh, outcomes as you go forward. What you are likely to see, what we see here, is um, it is evidence of uh, uh, 
best practice, but not complete evidence. That is the state that we live in, which is uh, not perfect, but working towards it. Next poll question. What percentage of your patients are screened for hepatitis C virus status uh, either upon or prior to admission? Select one of four categories of a percentage. So greater than 70%, greater than 70% for the people on the call. 100% of you answered that. Uh, we have, this is indication to me, that we have the pious in church today. We, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, best practice. Next. So the next poll question is, do you do it? Annually or semi-annually? I know there are other options, but that's where they, uh, uh, these fall in. So you're going to, you're, there should be little music in the background here and I'm loath to provide so nine percent of uh, nine percent of patients are screened uh, annually or semi-annually greater than 70 percent okay um, are 91 percent in that grant okay very good good HCV because HCV is uh, the one virus most likely to be uh, either acquired or transmitted uh, in the facility, uh, acquired by patients outside the facility or transmitted in the facility as a result of uh, infection control breaks. Um, next slide. This brings me to the opportunity to uh, introduce Dr. Care. She is, uh, as Renee said, uh, uh, an assistant professor at Villanova University. Uh, she has uh, a joint appointment with Mainland Health. She's a nephrology nurse for Fresenius. But most importantly for today's discussion, Tammy has uh, been a researcher, and her area of focus brought her to the study of patient safety culture across nephrology nurse practice settings. Uh, and she will speak to that topic today. Thank you so much, Tammy. Thank you very much, David. Advance my slide. So for those of you who were on the first webinar that Renee and Alan, Renee, Alan and I provided, the first couple of slides are certainly going to be a bit of a review. If you were not on that initial webinar, then this is going to be the background that you need to understand the infection control data that this first patient safety culture study in nephrology nurse practice settings revealed. This study was conducted in 2014 by myself and Dr. Beth Ulrich. And today's presentation is an adaption of a presentation that Beth and I gave for ANNA just last month in Austin, Texas. So perhaps a few of you in the audience had the opportunity to see that presentation. I apologize for the delay. Oh, there we go. I'm trying to advance my slides. So as I said, this study was conducted on behalf of ANNA in 2014. Uh, Beth and I were the two researchers, and we had tremendous support from the American Nephrology Nurses Association. It was the first study 
to the best of my knowledge, that looked at the culture of safety in nephrology nurse practice settings. And I'll define those settings for you in just a minute. We actually combined the AHRQ hospital and medical office tools so that we could meet all nephrology nurse practice settings, not just the hospital setting, nor not just the outpatient or clinic setting. As those of you who've heard me speak before uh, have heard me say, the nurses spoke loud and clear. We had responses from nearly 1,000 nurses, actually 979 nurses to be exact throughout the United States. And we had our study open only for one month, so we weren't, we weren't on a six-month exploration to collect data. We, we were collecting our data over a relatively short period of time and the nurses spoke loud and clear. And I think the implications are certainly interprofessional implications that we can all apply to our practice today. Advance the slide. I'm sorry, Amy, my advancing is not working. So here are the settings that we looked at. We looked at hospitals, outpatient hemodialysis centers, PD clinics, office settings, uh, nephrology specific and trans plant specific floors and we allowed the nurses to describe other as long as they were a nurse practicing in a setting that primarily cared for nephrology patient populations. Uh, if they did not care for nephrology patient populations or were not in practice then they were excluded from our data and that was 50 participants that were excluded. So our final number was 929 participants for this study. Advance the slide. So here are the primary roles you'll see broken down. About 27% of our respondents were in the manager or administrator role. We had a little over 50% in that direct care RN role, 5% as an advanced practice nurse, 9% were educators, uh, 5 were in another category, and 1.4% did not respond. Advance the slide. What we found when we looked at our data, we had the quantitative data from the AHRQ combined surveys, and then we also asked two open-ended questions. And what we found when we looked at our data, glaringly, within the first couple of hours of looking at the data, the first thing that jumped off the page is that the underreporting of events and near misses was one of the most popular topics for these nurses to talk about. In addition, they talked about inadequate and unsafe staffing, long work hours, communication lapses, issues with training and compliance, and they also spoke about infection control infringements, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today with three of the items that we had within the AHRQ tool. Advance the slide. Thank you. So the first question that I'm going to pull you on is, this first question, infection control practices are followed per unit protocol. And you have the option to answer strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree. And here is your, here is your actual question. So please take a moment and respond. Infection control practices are followed per unit protocol. This is actually one of the items that we ask within our survey. Okay, so you can see that 80% disagreed, 80% agreed, and 13% strongly disagreed. We're going to now move forward to try to keep a mental um, picture of this particular data. It does not quite align with, with what the, um, the nurses actually told us in the survey. So if you can look at the survey here, and I want to take you to the right-hand side of these bars, and I'm not going to work our way through each of these lines, or we'll be here for the next two hours, but if you actually look at the purple, light purple band and look at the orange band, you'll see that those are the areas of concern, okay? Um, actually, I have that backwards, and I did this the last time I presented it. Infection control practices are, are followed per unit protocol. Um, disagree and strongly disagree off to the side, so they feel that those individuals are actually following through on the protocol. If we look at all participants, um, in that particular area. One of the things that we have actually seen time and time again, and we actually saw it on every single item of our AHRQ, is that the nurse managers and the administrators 
rated the safety culture or the practices more favorably in relationship to safety on every single item than the direct care RNs. And if we actually look at this data, we can see the direct care RN data is on the second bar graph down, and the RN managers and administrators are on the third bar graph down. And you can actually see that the managers and administrators more positively rate that infection control practices are followed per unit protocol. Okay, than the direct care nurses. And we saw that on every single item in the tools that we use. If you look on down to the bottom, you'll see that the nurses working in the peritoneal dialysis units, for the most part, rated that the infection control practices were followed um, more consistently than those nurses working in the chronic hemodialysis unit. And when you look at the nurses not working in the hospital, we're right at the middle of this bar graph, those nurses not working in the hospital, those numbers are almost identical to the nurses working in the chronic hemodialysis units when you look at those two bar graphs. So certainly when we look at this, we certainly have a lot of room for for improvement because infection control practices should be followed 100% of the time and we should not see this variation and we should not see the concern that we see with the disagree and strongly disagree on the right hand side of these these bar graphs. Advance the slide. So the next question again, another AHRQ item that we ask, personal protective equipment, PPE, is worn by staff as per unit protocol. P please select if you strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree with this statement. And we'll compare your responses to the responses of our, 300, our 929 nurses. Okay, so we, we see that for the most part, the majority fall in that agree at, with 61% and 28% strongly agree. And then we have 12% if we can find the disagree and strongly disagree. Okay, let's see. Uh, again, this is, this is not exactly where the nurses fell in relation to the responses that they provided. So we'll advance to the next slide. And again, we're looking at the disagree and strongly disagree because we're looking at a question that states personal protective equipment is worn by staff as per unit protocol. Again, we're seeing the same type of distribution here, that the nurse managers and administrators are more positively favoring that the PPE is being worn, whereas the direct care nurses are saying more, that they have more of a disagreement or strong disagreement with this particular statement. One of the things I'd like to mention at this point is when we look back at the data, we know that underreporting of near misses and actual underreporting all around was one of the issues that came out of this particular survey. So it may not fully be in the manager and administrator's fault category that they're not aware that these these issues are happening because underreporting is certainly one of the issues that we're being faced with here. Um, so again, when you look at this particular data, when you look at all respondents, you can see that if you look at the bottom, the percentage that you know we're around somewhere in the 15% the percent range um, of disagree or strongly disagree. And then we have those who fall in the neutral range as well. So again, we have a long way to go to really bring these numbers to where they need to be in that PPE should be worn by all staff as per unit protocol. We do see that the nurses working in the PD units had less of an issue. And in fact, they even picked neither more because perhaps it wasn't as um, in attached to their population. So again, we see a very similar distribution here. We'll advance to the next slide, please. And the last question I'm going to pull you on is staff in my unit wash their hands immediately after removing gloves. And certainly we know that best practice is immediately after removing gloves that the hands should be washed 100% of the time. So moving forward, we will pull this question. Your responses again are strongly disagree, disagree, agree or strongly agree. I'm trying to advance it. We're having a momentary lag. We'll have this up in just a moment. Thank you.
Tammy, one of the things that you and I have talked about is, uh, is how uh, nursing in a dialysis setting, any dialysis setting, acute or chronic, is different than nursing and culture in, uh, in that that may be on the wards or in ICUs, um, <clears throat> and our count, for example, of of glove changes per dialysis treatment per patient is is on the order of about 14, um, if that's if that's per policy and procedure. Uh, so you get an an idea of the magnitude of this particular problem. You're exactly right, David, and I think maybe we'll circle back and talk a little bit more more about this going forward because it certainly is a basic fundamental of medical and nursing practice, uh, but it certainly was an area of concern when we looked at our data. Okay, mm -hmm. so we see, wow, we really see this data kind of almost split in half here. So um, actually more strongly disagree uh, and disagree if we lump those two together than those who do agree. Uh, so yeah, it certainly is an area, and when, it, when we looked at our study, we can advance this forward, and when we looked at our study, as basic as this, this hand washing is, and we're taught to hand wash even before we get to kindergarten, we teach our children that, um, it, it's something that continues to plague us, and um, Dr. Garrick's information that she recently released, or a couple of years ago released, that we're not actually moving in the direction of improving hand washing, we're actually becoming more lax in our hand washing practices over the years. So again, we can, we can look at this data here and you can see that certainly it's this is probably the most concerning slide here. When you look at the bottom of the graph, all respondents working in chronic hemodialysis units, if you look at the orange and the blue bars combined, you'll see that we're somewhere around you know 28 percent of these respondents did not feel that 100% of time staff in the unit washed their hands after removing gloves. So we certainly we certainly have a long way to go, and we certainly in our chronic hemo units, um, the, from the direct care nurses chair side approach, that data on the second line is even worse. We have about 25% of the nurses that are, who are not washing their hands after removing the gloves. So we have a long way to go in this area across all disciplines, and certainly I don't think that this is specifically this question is geared just to the nurse because it speaks to the staff in the hemo and PD units, not the RNs. But so we're really looking at all players in this interprofessional setting. So moving ahead, speed things up here. That's the end of my polling questions. When we looked at the narrative data, we found a number of things, and these are some of the themes that came out time and time again. And I pulled a few quotes just to represent those themes. The nurses spoke about a very hurried nature or an assembly line mentality that David just kind of spoke about in some ways as well. We're doing the same task. We're repeating the same thing over and over again. And they really felt that this assembly line mentality, bring the patients in, give them treatment, move them out, bring the next patient in after setting the machine up uh, has related to these infractions or infringements in infection control. There was concern about the architecture of units, that spaces were cramped, they were too small, patients were really too close together when they were on any type of precaution, contact precaution is this particular quote, but any kind of isolation of precaution. Nurses spoke about the fact that the architecture of the unit and the lack of space really prevented the protection of the patients against transmission. And then one of the things that perhaps has come out in other webinars is that nurses and and technicians and all staff were finding workarounds. They were taking shortcuts to get the work done in the time that they needed. And this particular sh shortcut focused on the tech wearing only half the PPE and running from one machine to the other with only a small squirt of the alcohol gel sanitizer on the hands in between movement from patient to patient. And we all know that that is not, um, that is not safe practice in any manner whatsoever. So those were some of the narratives. But on the other side, the nurses had best practices to share. They wanted to talk about things that they were doing well, and we asked them about those things they were doing well. For example, one staff member said, my staff is very aware of infection prevention procedures, and they educate the patients on the same. The patients critique us if we miss something, and we're going to come back to this patient role in infection control. Also, they spoke about and then one nurse spoke about a poor process for cleaning the dialysis stations during turnover, and they actually, this unit actually implemented the CDC dialysis station cleaning checklist. I bring this actually up because I want you to know that there are a number of evidence-based 
resources, checklists, pieces of data out there. You do not need to go back and recreate the wheel because these pieces are already out there for you to start implementing into your practice. And one of the things they did is they implemented it one bay at a time to uh, guarantee success. Trying to advance. There we go. All right, so one of the things I just mentioned is the importance of talking to patients, and I want to share with you just a little story um, regarding a study that I did with some other um, American Nephrology Nursing Association nurse researchers. We actually looked at, and I'm not going to get into the background of the story too much, but we actually looked at implementing a hemodialysis catheter protocol at home that allowed individuals with a well-heeled tunnel catheter to not wear a dressing over the catheter and we allowed them to shower. We actually received support, not financial support, but experience and expertise support from Dr. Callen at the CDC to go forward with this particular, what we wanted to be a research study. Unfortunately, it ended up being a pilot study. And as we embarked upon this study, before we actually taught the individuals how to shower, and gave them permission not to wear a dressing over their well-tunneled hemodialysis catheter. As we embarked upon this study, we as a group of nurse researchers were quite concerned um, you know, about the risks that this, this project was going to take. But when we actually started interviewing the patients about the way in which they were caring for the hemodialysis catheter at home, we were quite shocked. The individuals started telling us stories such as, oh, I shower with my catheter anyway. Sometimes I take, leave the dressing on, it gets wet, I dry it with a hair dryer, or I take the dressing off. One individual spoke about actually taking that dressing and hanging it on the towel bar and then slapping it back on when they finished the dressing, when they finished the shower. Another individual spoke about he actually placed a baggie over the dressing area and duct taped it to his skin. I can't imagine the, imagine the excoriation. But nonetheless, once we realized what these individuals were actually doing at home, we knew embarking upon this study was less risky than we originally thought it was. So we would not have been aware of these practices because the nurses actually, the patients actually said to us, the nurses yell at us if the dressing is wet when we come in, so they are finding their own workarounds. Um, and then they were, they were actually very open and genuine in sharing with us before they started uh, the actual study. So talking to the patient certainly cannot be stressed enough. Moving forward. There are a number of tools that are out there. Um, you will find on this webinar homepage, or the actual webinar page itself, an article that Dr. Ulrich and I published. And at the end of that article, you will actually find about a three-quarter page of tools that you can use that are evidence-based to guide practice. HR Q tools, CDC tools, the Joint Commission tools, National Kidney Foundation, and World Health Organization guidelines are all, all on that page. So you can get those right from, the, from that paper. So again, you can use those tools. You do not need to go back and recreate these things on your own. One of the things I'd like to direct your attention to, though, is the AHRQ ESRD toolkit, specifically made for the patient population that we care for. As many of you are probably aware, this toolkit was released in January of 2015, and it was created to assist facilities in treating patients with end-stage renal disease to prevent infections. It is evidence-based and it's module-based. And you'll see that the modules focus on creating a culture of safety, clinical care, using the checklist and audit tools. They're created for you. Grab one, start using it. And again, this patient and family engagement theme that's going to run throughout the course of this particular webinar. I'd like to share some evidence with you from one dialysis unit in Wisconsin, Purity Dialysis Unit, started using the ESRD toolkit, and they achieved a 75% decline in the hospital-acquired infections from dialysis patients participating in this project. Again, this project and these particular toolkit elements checklist promote best practices. It helped the facility make practice changes that led to fewer infections. And again, the modules are focused on many of these things that we're talking about today. Hand hygiene, the use of antiseptics, proper connection and disconnection of, a, of hemodialysis catheters, and also the scrub the hub procedure as published and we're all aware of by the CDC. So again, the focus is really placed on establishing open lines of communication between the staff and the patients very early in the use of this toolkit as well, so enhancing that communication. So success is already being noted and published in the use of this ESRD toolkit. 
All right, so Tammy, this thanks. Point, yeah. This station back over to David. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks so much for that, and um, that's the setup, folks, for uh, um, for the the next 30 minutes. We have 30 minutes left in the webinar, and we have about 36 participants. Again, this is a safety meeting. We expect your participation. We need your participation, and <clears throat> what we're got, what we're asking now is just to broaden your uh, ideas about the about the kinds of questions that that. Uh, that you that you might uh, be prompted to think about here uh, AV access buttonhole cannulation what percentage of patients in your facilities uh, have buttonhole cannulation in contradistinction to uh, rope ladder cannulation pick one category so the majority have 10% or less, uh, the vast majority, but there are some uh, in the range of 11 to 20%. Um, and that's encouraging. Uh, that number uh, should probably not be zero because buttonhole cannulation is required for short segments and some very difficult AV cannulations uh, in center. Uh, but there's no question that buttonhole cannulation, under the best of circumstances, still has a uh, bloodstream infection rate of um, approximately that of um, a, a CVC, uh, or for that matter, peritonitis. Next. Does your facility use Scrub the Hub method for CVC care? Answer yes or no. One hundred percent. Again, evidence evidence of the pious. Um, that's exactly right, and that's that's really a firm piece of evidence there, uh, because it is right at the beginning of the, it's the f touch contamination of the hub is the first step in colonization and uh, interluminal colonization, which leads in turn to bloodstream infection. Thanks. Um, so uh, I turn to the audience now. We uh, we are going to ask you, what one step can you do differently? Uh, this is just another way of asking uh, what you're most concerned about um, or uh, where are opportunities for improvement lie. You've listened and you've watched Tammy and you, you have seen the kinds of answers that, uh, that uh, Tammy's survey has, uh, has gotten and from oh, the way you answer it sounds as if audience experience is not much different uh, from experience in the survey. So um, at this point, I turn to you and I and I ask for uh, questions that you might uh, pose to us through uh, chat or by raising your hands. Uh, let me go to the next slide, and while you think about that. Just consider, just consider this first step. We had the theme of the patient. The patient is one of three uh, at the chair side. The patient, the PCT, and the nurse uh, for every treatment every day. Don't leave the patient out uh, uh, of the equation. Um, and, you know, it was interesting for me to watch and see the difference between the nurse managers perception and those who are frontline nurses that the distinction when there is a distinction between perceptions it means that the group the team is not sharing concerns not sharing observations it begins with the patient if the patient is seeing and talking about what they're seeing uh, then the then the team is sharing uh, that information so that has to be taught and it has to be practiced one way you might do this well. Think about that, um, Tammy. How do you, how do you think about that? 
So as I mentioned earlier, I certainly think you know that the patient has to be an integral part of this. And one of the things that I'll mention, and I'll come back to the AHRQ tool, toolkit, um, you know, certainly there are crucial conversations that need to happen throughout the course of caring for the patient um, for, by all providers of the healthcare team. And sometimes those conversations can be very difficult. They can even be very difficult for the patient to bring forward because when the patient brings it forward, believe it or not, the patients feel, feel, feel fearful that they will be retaliated against. And it's been shared with nurses time and time again in dialysis and nephrology settings that they're afraid to bring their concerns forward. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm dealing with a cold today. Nonetheless, um, one of the things that I would bring you back to is the use of that AHRQ tool to get toolkit. And I'm going to stop, David. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Um, uh, um, and I'll, I'll let you recover here. We have. Um, I'm, I'm looking for questions. One question coming up um, uh, from Renee is how many facilities engage in real-time safety audits to be uh, in real-time safety audits. So this is this is not an audit once a month. Uh, as uh, the AHRQ and uh, CDC might recommend, and, and we have as, as standard governance in the facility. But what about real time? What about real time? Um, and, and that is that is where the patient or the teammate, or the uh, the technician or the nurse uh, sees a uh, a break. In hand washing technique, for example, or PPE worn incorrectly, uh, what what is your experience of that in your facilities? And do facilities do that routinely on a day to day basis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was struck by the fact that 100% said we all, of course, taught scrubbing the hub, but do we watch to be sure it actually happens? I was, I was told yes, exactly. Uh, I, I was in a conversation with a hospital epidemiologist in a, a department of epidemi infection uh, epidemiology in one of the universities in the United States known for infection epidemiology, um, and I asked, "How are you doing on hand washing?" They said, "We have a really great program, and we have about average um, results." <laughs> Um, and David, we have a, David, we have a question from Leslie Dinwiddie. Sure. Leslie, good to hear from you. It's good to hear from you, too. Good to uh, know that you're on this program with us. Um, I have, uh, when you asked about one, one thing that we can do, and I realized that the responses are probably meant to be part of the actual infection control process. Uh, but the thing that I have really discovered this year through working on a program uh, about preventing the RBSI is that what we really have to change is our mindset. Uh, there was a very good blog, a nursing blog, uh, back in July of this year that compared our attitude to infection, uh, especially uh, catheter-related bloodstream infections, as we just assume that if we have X number of patients with infections, uh, with, with catheters, excuse me, we're going to have infections. It's, it's, you know, you try and reduce them, you've got to do the right thing, but you will have infections. This blog suggested that if we took an airline uh, crash prevention uh, approach rather than um, car crashes approach, that we really we need to believe and make a commitment to zero tolerance for any kind of infections, and we need to change the mindset. And I do think that zero percent is possible. We've got literature coming out of Peter Pronovost's work uh, and this uh, blog, and I'll be happy to share this blog with anyone who would like it, uh, shows, has some very, very good examples of uh, dramatic uh, improvements in reduction of catheter-related bloodstream infections. Uh, one place in California, Roseville, went seven years without an infection, and that uh, unfortunately was broken in 2014 in a dialysis facility. Two infections uh, appeared, and it turned out these were dialysis contract nurses. 
and they've corrected that situation. I believe that zero tolerance is what we have to yeah. uh, have. Yeah. 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 Great point. Great point. Uh, Refer to uh, Leslie. Yeah, Leslie, it's Tammy, and I completely, I've recovered here. Um, I completely agree with you, and, and I would add to that that if um, members of the audience have not had the opportunity, although the video was about five years old at this point, if they've not had the opportunity to watch Chasing Zero, which exactly focuses on chasing zero percent infection rate and it also focuses on safety. If you've not had an opportunity to see that, give yourself 57 minutes because again, there's some wonderful evidence in there as to how unit, how not units, hospitals have actually chased the zero. And Dennis Quaid actually narrates it um, on the heels of the air with heparin and his two twin babies. So definitely worth your time, um, 57 minutes of your time. falls into the general category of um, of avoiding the tyranny of low expectations. CBC related blood, right? Um, I think that's what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm saying, and, and I think that if we believe it, we can achieve it. So one of the things that we have not done as an industry is to standardize uh, care. So we have uh, for uh, uh, for the initiation, um, exit side care, and and then takeoff um, at, for CVC care. Those three different steps. And what we found in our experience, and we were working with Peter Pronovos Group, uh, the Armstrong Institute. Um, and what we found was repeated interruptions by uh, of the nurse uh, at the chair side uh, by others, but also having to leave the site uh, to go get supplies um, with it is 14, 15 different items for put on uh, another uh, 11 to 13 items for takeoff and. Sometimes to the street. So that led to CVC kits. CVC kits didn't lead to zero, but their most their most important uh, contribution was to standardize uh, for uh, facilities and for for every nurse, every CVC, every treatment, exactly what was done with exactly the same stuff. So that that gives us the evidence base uh, to start making incremental improvements along the continuous improvement pathway. I'd like to also, David, point out that we have a comment here by Cynthia Christensen, and she talks about she very much likes the idea of implementing full guideline recommendations one day at a time and having the patients speak up. And before I actually lost my voice a few minutes ago, what I was actually trying to get to <laughs> is by using the AHRQ toolkit in that nine-minute video, the, there's two nine-minute videos. One video shows poor communication, poor infection control procedures, uh, a, a lack of safe environment all around when we look at the safety culture. Uh, that video can very easily be shown in nine minutes to patients. It should be used for crucial conversations. It can be a lead-in to having difficult conversations about any type of safety or infection control issue. So not only is it for the healthcare provider, but certainly it can be for the patient because the patient is actually part of this video, is a member of the healthcare team. And then there is a video that shows all of these things being done in the correct manner. So again, using such a video really can, can be used, if used properly, to empower the patient to speak up and prevent them from that this fear of retaliation or just fear in general that they're going to be taken out upon if they report something. So again, that safe culture has to be extended to the patient as well if we're going to get them to start reporting and speaking up. Yeah. So we have, we have, we have a question from Nancy Pierce. Oh, um, um, I lost the audio, but I got it back by calling in. I I missed a little part of the program, but. Um, but I'm back uh, on. And Amy, can uh, you tell Nancy how to um, how to view the yeah. recorded session? Absolutely. Um, when everyone gets their follow-up email, in addition to the evaluation survey, you will have a link with the recording.
That sounds great. Great. I can't remember what I was about to say. Um, so this is just, I, it's just Renee, I just had a question about whether or not units have um, implemented the CDC's checklist across the board and part of my interest in that was some of the data that suggested that though the checklist may first appear cumbersome that for units that actually did it, they found it took five minutes more a day but actually resulted in improved care, more time with the patient and um, more complete cleaning of the machine and the accessories like the blood pressure cuff, et cetera, than when they didn't do it. So I was curious whether or not our facilities across the country routinely use that or have implemented it, and if so, how they found it. Has anyone I'm, used it? I'm, <laughs> I'm stunned yeah. by the silence, right? Yeah. Uh, we had we had experience with um, checklist that checklist specifically uh, in our in CDC kit. So we we did the bundle and we put the, everything into a bundle um, and uh, and then we included the checklist in the bundle. So it's kind of a, the checklist was the process checklist for the bundle. Uh, and what we found was that nurses w would not use the checklist but would use the bundle. Uh, and found the bundle very helpful. And the nurses not using the bundle uh, were interrupted uh, uh, more frequently and stepped away from the care area uh, more frequently than if they used the bundle. Hmm. I, um, full stop. Um, A little more on tyranny of low expectations. See if this resonates with you. So here's the scenario. A, a, uh, let's, let's, let's make this not somebody part of the core team, the core care team at Chairside, but um, a, a physician, a social worker, a, a dietitian rounding. Uh, um, on patients walks onto the treatment floor without PPE, touches patients, and between patients does not wash hands, does not sanitize hands or sanitize a, a stethoscope. Um, it, what do you do? Um, how common is that? Uh, is that overlooked in your facilities? Um, and my perspective on this is that it is pernicious to overlook that behavior, and it and it's and it goes right to the tough conversations, and, and it it goes if if I'm the PCT, I should be able to stop the physician, I should be able to stop the medical director. It doesn't matter. Uh, my job is to prevent harm coming to my patient. If I'm the nurse, the same. Um, anybody on the treatment floor should be able to uh, to be able to give feedback and feel that the feedback is uh, that that will can be given without retribution. And the only way for that to happen, it seems to me, uh, is for and being top-down support for this bottom-up kind of feedback, that um, and and then practice, practice so that everybody on the team sees that it happens and sees that it's safe, S safe, safe to give critical feedback. As one facility administrator said to me, "Oh, I don't give them a choice. <laughs> we don't have an argument." <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but I ask you, I the 36 of you on the on the line. How you know? How do you deal with it? And 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 are you getting the support you need?
We have a hand raised by Cindy Christensen. Uh, give us one moment and we'll unmute you. Hey, Cindy. Great to hear from you. The nurse is getting um, called away, but the caps are too. I mean, there are mach machines that are beeping, there are patients that are, their blood pressures are low or asking for things or new people coming in. And um, I don't know, you know, that may be a staffing issue. It may be kind of a, a patient assignment issue and there may, may be other things. But I think that issue of multitasking has to be a big safety problem. Multitasking. Thanks, Cindy. Um, Tammy, do you have a perspective on that? I'm sorry, can you re just repeat that part of the question again? So it's the, the multitasking multi on the part of the multitasking. I mean, it certainly is an issue. Um, and it was an issue that the nurses wanted to speak about when we, we collected the narrative part that, you know, they're always being pulled in a different direction. Um, and replacing an RN number on a unit with a patient care technician um, certainly is not an equal replacement. And David and I actually had an interesting conversation about this because I said, you know, you don't want a flight attendant flying the airplane. Well, you need that nurse at the chair side because there are things that that nurse can do from an assessment, medication, and holistic care standpoint. So the being pulled away, that's a really challenging thing because you have individuals who hemodynamically are, are changing from minute to minute and, you know, from one hour to the next hour. Um, and it, it's a concerning. I wish I had the right answer for that because it probably was one of the most concerning issues that came through in the data that Bethan and I collected because the nurses wanted to tell us, I'm ready to move away from this role, I'm ready to give this job up because it is far too demanding and I'm putting my nursing license on the line. So they were seeking, you know, another dialysis position or they were getting out of nephrology nursing altogether. So I wish I had the, the correct answer because what we found is that so many of these issues are so intertwined, we can't just look at infection control without looking at staffing and looking at staff mix and looking at underreporting. They all are linked together. So Tam, I just wanted to segue, this is Renee, just um, there was a study done a couple of years ago that actually suggested that dialysis nurses noticed two things about the care being provided by individuals who did not have a, all the training that goes with being an RN, mm -hmm. and infection control actually was paramount among that, and then when they surveyed dialysis technicians, they stated that they needed more training in infection control. There was a corollary study that suggested one of the big differences is that nurses, especially nurses with a lot of experience, which as Tammy just said is getting very challenging in our profession because of the turnover rates, nurses with more experience had much greater situational awareness. So they saw when things weren't going per protocol more quickly and when the patient wasn't responding correctly, they saw that more quickly than nurses with less training and both of those groups saw it more quickly than did dialysis technicians. Again, suggesting that you know the need for ongoing training and support is clearly there and it's our job to support the technical staff and the dialysis nursing staff from the management perspective. Yeah, I, um, I, I agree. I, I'm, what's in my head is how do, how do we not only agree but give you some tangible things to do that help. One is one is realizing how absolutely critical it is to have nursing leadership in the in the facility is strong and is well supported um, by uh, by both the leadership in the facility and uh, and outside the facility um, and that that education and training extend uh, uh, down through so that there's clinical and operational discipline right at the at the chair side where where it needs mm -hmm. to be. The dimensions from the physician side, from the medical director side that I often see is how distracting it is uh, when the medical director has not uh, prevented uh, an admission to the facility um, uh, for a high acuity patient where the acuity is just beyond the capacity of, of um, 
the team to, to care without being distracted, without distracting from the care of others on the treatment floor. Uh, that would be one thing, uh, is to say, man, get your governing body working uh, to, to screen and make sure if you're making decisions to admit high acuity patients that you have the, the right staff for that. Right. And David, with that goes the concept that we talked about in the first webinar about establishing a culture of safety where you have t team steps training or crew resource management training so people are willing and confident in their ability to speak up and call things out like that. Right? Yeah. You know, we need to think about can we handle that patient, what do we need to handle it, or you're not washing your hands, which all goes with establishing a culture of safety. Yeah, yeah, so much. And, and if you're doing it, if you're taking the time to have the huddle. Um, uh, it saves so much time later on and and kind of stops that cycle of ascending multitasking. Um, but to your point, uh, an assessment and care planning meeting, the best ones are the ones that happen before the patient is admitted, <laughs> uh, where your real experts can say, yeah, you know, I don't know. We, I don't think we can admit that patient, or we can admit that patient under only the following conditions. Right. Well, we are at the 56-minute uh, mark, and I think Tammy, um, like to have you close us out. I, um, I'll, I'll thank everybody on the call for your participation. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and got as much uh, out of it as I did. I also want to thank uh, Tammy for all of her work in putting this together uh, and for have, having done with Dr. Ulrich the uh, fundamental uh, groundbreaking work to get it uh, to this place. So, um, Tammy? Great. Thank you, David. Certainly has been my pleasure. <clears throat> so in closing, um, certainly we all know that the next step is up to you. It's up, actually, it's up to each of us. And I think if there's any good news at the end of this webinar is there are a number of tools, checklists, videos, flow charts, a volume of information out there that we can pick up, pick one thing, and bring it into practice and start making those changes as an interprofessional team, including our patients, right in there as part of that team mix. So the questions to consider and potentially bring back to your area of, of employment and practice is how will you and what evidence will you use to reduce the infection rates in your unit? And certainly today we talked about a variety of different types of infection and, and, and routes of transmission. How will you engage all staff members in infection control practices? How will you involve those patients in infection control? What will you ask them? What are they holding back? What are they hiding? Because we've not asked them or we have told them, don't do this, why did you do that? So ask, ask instead of tell and educate with them as an equal member and Enfo enforce the basic fundamentals. It seems crazy in 2015 that we are talking about hand washing, but we're talking about hand washing because it was the biggest problem that came out of the data that Beth and I collected. And then monitor the results of your actions and take that next step. But it's also your responsibility to share that information. Share it with your patients. Share it amongst the unit. Share it within your organization. Share it regionally and nationally so that we can all learn together and most importantly, make this environment a safer environment for our patients. That's why we all do what we do every single day in our professional lives. Thank you, David. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Amy. And thank you for all of you who attended today's webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Tammy. Thank all righty. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So we'll see you on the next webinar on the 19th to wrap up the transition.